ID. Uh, if, uh, please note uh, that we are getting started now. So Astrid, do you mind just typing in to see into the chat just to make sure that everyone can hear us? So uh, this is our statewide um, AD webinar discussion for the summer, uh, right before Summer Institute. Joining us today, we have uh, staff from the Minnesota Department of Education. Uh, my name is Brad Haskamp. I'm the secondary, adult secondary credential and policy specialist here at the Department of Ed. And I'm Jody Versa. I'm the program quality specialist. This is Astrid Lydon, the ADE professional development specialist. Julie Dinko, the transition specialist. And um, unfortunately, Todd Wagner, our state ADE director, was not able to join us today. Um, and uh, Neither was Sherry Eichinger, our administrative support. And many of you will remember seeing emails come from her. Most of our emails come through her. Also, we have our, uh, not joining us today, is Tim E. Larson, our grant specialist, and Alice Smith, our GED record specialist and administrative support. So for today's session, just like every other session, I uh, just want to let you know that, the, um, that you'll be able to uh, type in any questions um, using the webinar's chat function. Uh, you'll also be able to raise your hand um, if you want to ask a question uh, audibly or over the phone or, or using your computer mic. You just rate, uh, click on the hand next to your name and, um, and we'll call on you when we have time uh, during Q&A. And we'll unmute you then as well. And again, if you have any technical assistance needs or are having any problems um, uh, seeing or hearing us, uh, just ask Carla um, from Literacy Action Network for help. And thanks again to Literacy Action Network and Carla Vian for providing our technical support today. So today we have a long list of topics actually. As you can see here, we're gonna talk about transitions, the fall manager meeting, PD, support services, grants, hours, and targets, program improvement, uh, upcoming data needs, assessment and GED slash high school equivalency testing. And we'll have plenty of time for your questions as well. So let's kick it off with transitions. Uh, Julie, do you wanna let us know a little bit about transitions? Sure, basically um, what I'm looking for is just if people could chat in the chat box, if they know, uh, if you're currently working if any teachers are working with career and tech technical education instructors either in a bridge program or in an integrated education and training course um, with minnesota state post-secondary cte instructors i know that i have asked the regional transitions coordinators uh, for this information as well we're trying to work uh, closer with the career and technical education uh, staff at Minnesota State, and also here the K, K through 12 uh, career and technical education staff, just to align the work that adult basic education does closer to career and technical education. And I know there are some programs that are doing this, but I just want, I think I have, um, I think there are more out there, but I don't know about them. And I would like to compile a list of all the uh, programs that exist. So if you could just chat in the box, like uh, who the individual, actually what consortia and then what post-secondary institution they're with and possibly what career and tech ed program uh, they're working on. This does not, a lot of people think of career and tech ed as, you know, automotive, welding. This can also be businesses, financial. There's areas that are considered career and tech ed that people don't necessarily think are career and tech ed, but they are. Um, and that's it. I'll just see. Um, so please take a minute and let me know if you currently are working with any career tech ed people at the post-secondary level. We've had a couple people chat in, like Allison in Metro South is doing some work with CTE. Oh, uh, we also have uh, uh, the Minnesota Correctional Facility in Faribault. Uh, they, did a, 
they just did a construction bridge pilot, which was a collaboration between uh, ABE and uh, South Central College, I believe, and or South Central um, College and uh, Worthington. Worthington. Oh, good. Yep. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Uh, this information will be really helpful as we continue to try to um, leverage our statewide partnerships with uh, CTE at Minnesota State and also to identify potential CTE and ABE instructor faculty pairs for professional development. Looks like Alice right. and the Metro South is working with Hennepin Tech okay. and RAVE. Um, they're doing a co-teaching with a soldering certificate course with uh, Dakota County Technical College. Okay, those, those are all good. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, Marshall and Midwest. Yeah. Any others you know of, please, please let me know. You can always email me as well, too. Thank you. Okay, now let's talk about the ABE Fall Manager Meeting. And so I'm going to turn it over to Jody. Okay, so we just want to make sure that everybody knows that this fall we are going to go back to the more traditional in-person uh, day-long fall manager meeting. Um, we didn't do that last year. Um, so please make sure that's on your calendar for Tuesday, September 25th. We are going to have that at the TIES Conference Center, which if you're not familiar with that, it's not far um, from MDE here in Roseville. Uh, we're planning a 9 a.m. to 3.30 day, um, but just a note that we uh, one interesting thing that's going to happen at that event is we'll have all the supplemental service providers there, and they will have um, a little bit of a fair set up for you. So you, if you get there at 8.30, you can um, browse that, and that'll be available later throughout the day as well. So please make sure that you have that on your calendar. And we wanted to take this opportunity to find out if any of you have any thoughts or ideas about things that you would really like to know more about or things that you would like to discuss at the fall ABE manager meeting. So I will give you a minute if you have any thoughts about that. So well, folks can chat in there. Yep, feel free to ideas. chat them in. Um, and also, um, and the eval at the end of this webinar, um, we, that question is also on our eval. So you'll have another opportunity at the end of the webinar today to give your input. But we'd be happy to take any thoughts in the chat right now if anybody has any anything you want to make sure. Assessment. Yep. That's a biggie. <laughs> Student recruitment and retention. Yeah, that's yes, they, that's a big issue of concern yep. across our field for sure. All right, you can certainly feel free to continue typing in ideas and or um, enter them in the email at the end of the web chat, or certainly just reach out to any of us via email. But we just uh, want you to know that we are interested in your input about what would be the most important or most interesting for you at the fall manager meeting. Okay, now let's talk about professional development. Astrid. Hey, I'm sure everyone has this on your radar, but just a reminder that Summer Institute is coming up next month. Uh, there are two pre-conference options, or three actually, um, at the Summer Institute. These are held uh, Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday morning before Summer Institute. For any of your new staff, or um, if anyone needs a refresher to the ABE system, we have the ABE Foundations pre-conference option. And then there's also the opportunity to get your CCRS Foundations training in either ELA or math. Um, so this is the, the basic level training that uh, we expect that everyone in the field should have, and it's a requirement to go through the CCRS cohort. You'll get an overview of the standards in that area and the key instructional shifts. Um, also, poster sessions will be held on Thursday afternoon. I know um, they are still looking for poster sessions. You can fill out the poster session call for proposals on the Literacy Action Network website. This is a really great um, low pressure way to share an idea that's working in uh, one of your classrooms or programs. So I encourage you to share via the poster sessions. A reminder also that we will, as we do every year, have regional meetings on Thursday afternoon. 
Uh, it is very important that um, you attend these regional meetings along with your staff. This is our opportunity to meet face-to-face -face with staff from all around the state to hear about what your pressing um, issues and professional development needs are, as well as to share updates related to what's happening in that region. So we hope that you will attend and encourage your staff to attend. Brad, do you want to say a few words about the policy input session you'll be on? Yeah, we've just uh, we've had some uh, folks uh, approach us saying, "Hey, we have some uh, questions or issues that we'd like to raise about policies and maybe updating policies." If that pertains to you, if there are some policy issues that you would like to talk through, we're going to have a forum uh, during. A, we're going to have a concurrent session that we'll be asking. It will be a policy field input session. So look for that. Um, uh, look for that session that will be at our institute. It is on Thursday or Friday. I have to admit, I forgot right now when that session is. But if that if that pertains to you, if you have some some specific policy issues you would like to see addressed, uh, come and talk to me um, at that session or uh, uh, send me an email. But we will have a larger platform to share these ideas at Summer Institute with that uh, with that concurrent session. And if you're looking for when that session is scheduled or when any of the sessions are scheduled, there is a draft of the program uh, scheduled on the Literacy Action Network website under the Summer Institute tab. I want to welcome our new uh, cohort of statewide PD ABE program representatives. Thank you to everyone who applied to um, contribute your uh, expertise and experience to our statewide PD group. Um, we have a, a wonderful diverse group representing um, various regions and types of programs and roles within ABE. So we're very excited to start working with that group at our next statewide PD committee meeting next week. So thank you to everyone who applied and to those who are going to be serving on that committee. Also want to make sure that you've marked your calendars for the ABE Math Institute that's going to be held on Friday, September 21st at Hamlin. We're really excited to bring uh, Cynthia Bell back from New York. Cynthia's presented for us several times and has gotten rave reviews. She'll be um, sharing a workshop around best practices for teaching and learning mathematics. Um, this will be really important if you've got teachers um, who do not have a formal math background or math training, this is a great opportunity to hear from what the National Council for Teachers of Mathematics have identified as uh, the key teaching and learning practices for mathematics. So we're excited to bring Cynthia back. Um, Atlas will be offering travel scholarships to help get people there um, and keep an eye out for registration, which will open in late August. And just a reminder about our various other fall ABE events coming up. Make sure you've got these on your calendars. Jody mentioned the fall manager meeting. The fall North Regional will be in Bemidji this fall, October 25th and 26th. The MLC fall tutoring kickoff on October 27th. Those of you who will be writing your narratives this coming year, October 30th will be that workshop day. The fall South Regional will be in Mankato on November 2nd. Support Services Conference, November 8th and 9th, and a reminder that, that the first day of that conference, um, we offer ABE Foundations as well as Assessment Certification Training. So that'll be a good opportunity to get trained on the test, get up to speed on those new tests. And then the Volunteer Management Conference on November 30th. And all of that information can be found on our PD calendar. And finally, I just want to um, encourage those of you who are working in Adult Career Pathway courses to consider uh, sending your instructors or curriculum writers for those courses to the Adult Career Pathway course design cohort. We offered this for the first time last year, and um, we've made a few revisions based on that experience, um, extended um, the face-to-face -face time for folks. Um, it will be kicking off and with two, two days in December, and then virtual work on improving or developing an adult career pathway course to be um, shared via the Atlas Online Resource Library, and then a final workshop in May. So this will be led by Liz Andrus. Um, it was a, an excellent opportunity last year. Applications will be available by August 1st to October 5th, and just a a note to those of you who did chat that you are working with CTE instructors currently on Career Pathway courses, 
We will be opening up this opportunity to existing ABE and CTE instructor faculty pairs if they would like to partner together to improve or develop an ABE bridge course or an integrated course. Um, so um, keep your eyes out for that. Okay, now let's uh, transition and talk a little bit about our supplemental services grants or um, our, what we're now calling the ABE support network. Okay, thanks Brad. So um, we have awarded uh, a round of now three year grants to provide ABE supplemental service uh, activities. And you can see an overview of those here. Um, we are providing all of the same categories of activities that we did in the past. And we have the same slate of provi providers that we had in the past. And we just wanna go through a very brief overview of these, what these organizations can offer you and your staff. And as Jody said, there will be an opportunity at the ABE manager meeting to meet directly with representatives from all of these organizations to ask your questions, find out more about what they offer. Many of them will also be at the vendor fair at Summer Institute or presenting various sessions at Summer Institute. So hope that all of you will um, take advantage of these wonderful resources that are available statewide. So let's take a look at what some of these activities are. Um, as Brad mentioned, we are going through a, a bit of a name change here. The grants are officially called the ABE Supplemental Service Grants, but we found that that terminology isn't entirely transparent, especially for those who are new to the field. So we are now referring to this whole group of uh, organizations as our ABE Support Network Providers. So you'll see those organizations here. So um, the bulk of our PD services are offered um, by Atlas at Hamlin University. So Atlas coordinates our regional activities, professional development focused on reading, math, uh, and transitions, as well as ESL and content standards. They've got a number of really robust online resource libraries that we would encourage you to check out. And they also coordinate our uh, adult basic education professional development communication. So they coordinate the weekly newsletter, MNA, MNABE Connect, um, that is created by our ABE Support Service Network. And they also coordinate our centralized PD uh, calendar. The Minnesota Literacy Council holds two grants. One is for volunteer and outreach services. So they maintain our statewide adult literacy hotline and provide volunteer training, outreach and recruitment, as well as support for programs and individuals working with volunteers in, in ABE programs. They also hold the Technology Integration and Distance Learning Services Grant. So these services include training on the use of ECTOT educational technology, uh, distance learning, and digital literacy. Um, they run a number of ongoing PD experiences, including Distance Learning 101 and Distance Learning 102, and more recently, the Technology Integration Institute. Um, and they do have a, uh, maintain a website specifically around um, support for distance learning platforms and our distance learning policies. Disability Training and Support Services are provided through PANDA, housed at Robbinsdale Adult Academic Program. They have um, a wonderful resource on their disabilities website. And then they provide a variety of trainings, including training around universal design for learning, uh, disability topics. They have a lending library of resources that you and your staff can um, access. Um, and then provide consultation around serving students with disabilities. Assessment training and services, which will be um, extremely important this, week, this year with some of the changes to our assessments, are provided through Southwest Adult Basic Education. So they provide training around our NRS approved assessments. You can find more information on uh, their ADE assessment website. They also coordinate our support services conference and our support Professionals uh, Advisory and Resource Committee. 
program quality support services such as Summer Institute and our statewide committees are provided through the Literacy Action Network. Um, they also provide support for our standard adult high school diploma implementation and ABE marketing resources. And then support around transition services, specifically support for regional transitions coordination and support around workforce development collaborations is provided through the Minnesota Workforce Council Association. So you can find more information and links to all of these websites on our website, mnabe.org, um, under the Supplemental Services tab. Uh, as I mentioned, there will be opportunities to learn more about these providers and services at Summer Institute, at your regional meetings, and at the ABE manager meeting. But I'd like to take the opportunity now to see if anyone has any questions about any of those providers or the services offered. So if you have any questions about any of our uh, supplemental service providers or our AB support network and in, either individually or collectively about some of the services they provide, please uh, raise your hand, uh, click on your hand, or you can uh, chat in a question in the uh, chat box. While you're doing that, I also just wanted to let you know that we want to remind you that those slides and the information on each of the supplemental service providers, uh, we really want to make sure that you and all of your staff are aware of what they offer. Uh, may, some of our supplemental service providers or support, some of our AB support network feels they ha are being underutilized at times. So we really want to make sure that, uh, that everyone is aware of what they offer and what they, how they can help your program. Okay, feel free to chat in questions throughout the web chat as they might come up. Now let's uh, give an update on grants, contact hours, and targets. Let's first start off with our IELCE or our Integrated English Literacy and Civics Education Grants. Julie? Sure, um, listed off to the left-hand side are the nine grantees that were awarded grants in 1718. And, um, just a reminder that the narrative reporting for that first year is due to Sherry by July 31st. And then I'd also like to announce um, the three new grantees for the, just for this 2018-19 year. It's Osseo ABE, Hmong American Partnership, and Minneapolis ABE. So congratulations to those uh, three new grantees. And let's just rewind folks about uh, why we have three new grantees this year is that we ended up being a little underspent on our IELCE money. So we accepted those grantees based on who are the next highest scoring proposals from the 2017 submission. So. Go ahead. And then for the Navigating and Advising Support Services grant, um, in 2016, the Minnesota State Legislature legislature appropriated $100,000 and we gave them to the programs listed to your right. Um, there were four of them and then we recently um, had additional funding become available and so we uh, awarded, we went to the next in line which is Minneapolis and they received the next navigating and advising support services grant. So again, great congratulations to Minneapolis. Now let's talk about our overall statewide AD system and its contact hours. Um, what you'll notice here in this slide is that basically as a system uh, in the past 20 years, we peaked in contact hours in our 2011-2012 year. We got pretty close to 6 million that year. Ever since the 2011-2012 year, we have been declining in contact hours. Um, and in fact, this year, we actually fell below 5 million, million contact hours um, during the 2017-2018 year. And we have not been that low or we have not been below 5 million since the 2004-2005 uh, year. So this is the lowest we've been in more than 10 years in terms of numbers of contact hours. So because of this, what I will say is, that uh, for many of you that have been administrators for a while, you'll know that we have our 10-year average growth uh, cap 
that says how much our state ADE funding will increase. Um, unfortunately, we are now at negative growth over the past, like if we look at our 10-year average. So for the foreseeable future, probably for the, at least the next, uh, unless we see dramatic growth in the next couple of years, we will likely not see any growth in AB, state ABE funding unless there's statute change um, for the next 10 plus years. So what does that mean for contact hour rates? The positive side that I'll say to, to the overall statewide decline is that that means the overall uh, contact hour rate is going up. So what you can see here is that last year the contact hour rates uh, were $6.05 state and federally uh, 52 cents. For this current year that we just started on July 1st, this current fiscal year, the contact hour rate reimbursement from your 2017-2018 hours is $6.50, uh, and that's rounded to the nearest cent. And federally, that uh, comes out, and the federal amount is 61 cents per contact hour for your consortium, and that's what that part of your grant is, is now, um, that's the new formula for state contact hours and federal contact hours for the 18-19 fiscal year. Um, so you will see growth that way um, in that rate, um, luckily. So what I want to make sure that you do, though, is on July 2nd, Astrid sent an email to every fiscal agent, um, all 41 fiscal agents in our statewide system. We really need you to make sure to check the accuracy of the information that was sent. Are the total number of contact hours correct for your consortium? Does the funding look correct? We need to know um, by August 1st whether or not that that is correct. Um, because then we need to make a statewide adjustment if your uh, consortium's numbers are not correct. Please note, if you don't catch it and your program is audited and it found out you, it was discovered that you got too much or yeah, too much money, your consortium would have to pay that money back. The fiscal agent would be required to pay that money back. So that's why we re really need you to make sure that those numbers are accurate. And we really want you to check that during the month of July. So now we've talked about contact hours, let's talk about the negotiated target. So we do have targets going into the next two uh, fiscal years. And um, what you'll see on this is on the left-hand side of this call, uh, table, the left hand are each of our ADE and ESL levels, um, one through six on both sides. Then the red column is our national median performance for 2016, 2017 which was used to help develop the targets for us going into the next two years. What will, what you, uh, the way the feds look at this is they take all the ABE level uh, and that overall rate, and they take all the ESL levels and take that overall rate to determine whether or not we're above our targets and they weight that. So what we, they came out to, it, what, what came out is that we are below the national median in many of the levels. And so the feds are pushing harder than they've ever pushed us to increase our level completions. They're telling us we need to increase our level completions um, or we as a state will end up in program improvement ourselves, which none of us hope happen. So what you'll see in the third column are these are the negotiated targets for the 2018, 2019 year. Now I've joked in the past that many times this is like a car uh, negotiation, a used car negotiation. Unfortunately, this year they were refusing to negotiate. They pushed us to be at or above the national median um, in almost every level. So you can see that we have some of the most aggressive targets for uh, increased performance and increased level gains than we've had um, than we've had seen ever before, according to Todd. So the Feds are pushing us hard to do better, to get more level gains. And um, so you'll see some increased pressure from us to try to find ways to increase level gains. Are there any questions about these targets? Again, if you have any questions about the targets, please enter them in the chat function or uh, click, uh, click on your hand to raise your hand and we can call on you to ask a question um, over the phone or uh, computer. Oh, okay. 
Yep. So Pat Thomas said that she saw a discrepancy um, between what she lo first looked at uh, for contact hour, uh, contact the contact hour rate versus what I just reported. So Pat, unfortunately, there was a there was a glitch in the first set of data that was reported, and so you need to go back in there and look at your new numbers because the at the new contact hour rate did go down. Uh, there was somewhere where the number of hours was not being reported correctly, and so we had to re-enter the total number of hours, which dropped the rate by about four, uh, three to four cents. Um, so that is so go if you still have that fifty or six dollars and fifty three and a half cents rate on your fis uh, fiscal report, you need to re go back to the Minnesota Department of Education website, look up that report again because your adjustment your allocation has dropped since then. To the new six dollar and fifty cents. It's just actually just under six dollars and fifty cents. And then Brad, you have another question relating to this current slide on the national reporting system. Yep. And it's what so if if they don't meet their targets and we as a state are put into program improvement, yep. what would that mean for the locals? What would that so we don't know what the feds are currently doing for our statewide program improvement, but um, we envision that means a visit from the feds. And for those of you that were here when the feds visited, you know how painful that might have been. Um, <laughs> but it could involve a site visit from the feds. But what it will likely most def, uh, most likely include is we have to do some sort of program improvement plan where we as a state have to say how we're going to make sure that local programs do better. And so that will mean increased training, increased accountability requirements um, that we'll have to set at the statewide level and probably increased monitoring of, uh, of uh, program and student performance. And so it will likely mean a one to a multi-year uh, corrective action plan that we would have to develop. Um, our last corrective action plan um, from our 2014 visit, um, technically, I, I think we might have graduated from it, but we're not quite sure yet. We haven't heard, but I think they've given up on that last one. <laughs> but um, the, but that was a four-year process the last time we had a corrective action plan. I hope that gives you, Caroline, and for others, I hope that kind of answers what that, if we were put under program improvement or corrective action by the feds, that's roughly what we think it would be. I. The process is is new, so I don't know the exact, but I do believe it involves a, a rather intensive corrective action plan and an increased requirements on our local grantees or local programs. The nice part about the targets, what I will note as well, is that we now can see the targets for the next two years. So you can kind of see where we're building towards. And in some areas like ABE level five and ABE level six, there's gonna be some dramatic growth, like six percentage point growth between 1819 to 1920. Um, so there's there, and in some areas it's a little smaller, it starts maintaining or leveling out, which is great. But um, the feds are being very aggressive with us right now um, about performance and level, uh, level completion. We have another question. Some of the problem with level changes is that our students don't stay to be retested for 40 hours as their way to base level changes on students who have stayed long enough to be retested. So the short answer is um, no, the feds will do not allow that. They say that we need to report on students once they hit 12 hours to the feds. And um, and so when they were here in 2014, they said, well, they, they would say that we would need to increase uh, our expectations of how much per, uh, programming there is going on locally and increase uh, attendance expectations with programs and things like that. They, they would, they, they don't seem to, be interested in diving into the nitty gritty of that 12 hour to 40 hour gap. Um, and they just say, well, you need to do, you, programs need to offer more intensive programming or hold their students more accountable to make sure they get to the 40, which I think all of us that have worked locally understand that that is easier said than done, obviously. And the logistics of that are extremely difficult when we know we have students with highly trans, uh, with a lot of transitions going on in their lives, a lot of turbulence going on in their lives, and just a lot of other factors and priorities that they need to negotiate um, and live every day. And so I, I think when we work with local programs, we try to balance that expectation, but I think it's, it's, it's a difficult, it's, unfortunately the feds are not willing to negotiate on that. 
So for er uh, Eric's question about are they just using diploma achievement for ABE level six level gains? Yes, it's uh, diploma achievement and students leaving your program at ABE level six and then going on to post-secondary. That's what they're looking at. Okay, um, so let's move on then to program improvement. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Jody. Okay, so um, thanks Caroline for the setup. Um, so we're gonna talk again about program improvement. Those of you who've been in the field for a while remember the days when we had program improvement. Um, so, and, but we haven't for a few years as we all kind of adjusted to WIOA and then we did a, recompeted our federal AB funds and um, so now we've sort of reset and are getting back to some of our regular annual processes and program improvement is one of those and that um, now moving forward is kind of falling to me on our team to oversee that process and I just want to point out that I come from the field and as an ABE manager I went through the program improvement process so those of you who are groaning when you see this slide, just know that like I feel you. Um, and uh, we know that program improvement has been something that causes some anxiety and some angst for people in the field. But it, to kind of follow up on what Brad said, I think what we, what we want to, you to keep in mind, one thing to keep in mind is that an internal state program improvement process uh, will, will be more of a supportive, interactive, collaborative building experience than if the feds come in and do a program improvement process. So just keep that in mind. Um, so let's talk about program improvement. Let me back up for a second um, and just kind of catch everybody up because I know there are some also some newer folks who maybe um, started within the last year or two. You might not have a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, well, sorry, be, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Um, to answer the uh, straightforward question that those of you who have been around a while are, are asking, the question you have at this point is, when are we gonna do this again? So what we are announcing today is that the results from the program year we are currently in, so this year, 1819, results from that year will be used for a program improvement process That'll start a year from now, so starting in the fall of 2019. So we are at the beginning of the year in which the data will be used for program improvement. So now to back up, um, what what am I talking about when I'm talking about program improvement? So program improvement is about technical assistance, and um, it's a it's a process where ABE programs that are identified as low performing um, on certain measures receive additional technical assistance. And I'll tell you more details about that in a sec. Um, why do we do this? I think we've already kind of been talking about this, but it underlying the bottom, the bottom line justification or motivation is really to promote quality AVE programming across our state. It's also to make sure that we are implementing accountability practices in consistent ways across our field. And ultimately it is also to ensure that we are complying with the federal accountability requirements across the state as well. So in the past, um, accountability, the, the measure for program improvement was simply level gains. So, um, so many of you will remember that the report card would um, list all ABE consortia sort of from top to bottom in terms of level gain rates. And then the programs that fell at the bottom of that list would automatically be required to participate in the program improvement process. Um, and what that process looked like in the past was there were four parts. There was a workshop in the fall, and then um, there had to be some local, some work done in the local program to create some reports um, that reports and plans that talked about, you know, what are what improvements are going to happen, what changes are going to happen, 
part of during part of that planning process, there was a site visit from our team, and throughout the whole process, there was technical assistance. So that's historically, uh, in the past, what program improv improvement has looked like. Now the big question is, what will it look like in the future? And my answer is, that's a great question. Um, because that is still um, in process and still being um, decided exactly. But here's what I can tell you. Our intention for the future is to connect this program improvement process with a set of program quality standards, which you may have heard me talking about a little bit occasionally as a sort of a project that I'm working on. It's not a project that has moved along very far. Um, but just so you know, that is the intention moving forward. Um, for this coming year, um, we do know that level gains will still be the main focus or the main accountability indicator that we'll, we will be looking at. Um, we may also be including um, diplomas because that is now a measurable skill gain as well in addition to level gain. Um, and we know that the process, um, pieces of the process will probably be similar for this next round. So probably a workshop in the fall of 2019, um, a site visit, and then, you know, an expectation for some planning and creating documents to um, sort of guide that planning and technical assistance from our team throughout that process. Please note that there at the fall managers workshop in September, we will have more concrete plans to share with you about what the program improvement process is going to look like for next year. Any questions okay. on that at this point? And feel free to raise your hand or type into the chat. Okay. So with all of this, there are some upcoming data needs that we have from all of you from every consortium. So please note that we've mentioned this before, but uh, starting July 1st, we had a new, uh, a new data restriction or new data process kind of implemented. And that is a limit on entering hours, um, especially for students with no EFL. So any student that does not have a valid pretest uh, thus not a valid uh, educational functioning level, you will not be able to any, uh, any longer to enter more than 12 hours for them because every student is required to have a valid pretest. Um, so that is a new uh, process that started on uh, July 1st. Second, um, uh, then also for any student that you categorize as a conditional work referral, you will not be able to enter more than 30 hours for that student with your program. And wasn't that the one where it taught to 10% last year? Did not yeah, have... so in the in the data that we're looking at from the 2017-2018 years, uh, 18 year, 10% uh, of our students, and I think he was re mentioning 10 with more than 12 hours, or was it 10 overall? 10% no, overall, overall had no EFL. Oh. Okay. So, and it would be helpful to know what percentage actually of those without with more than 12 hours. So the other big thing, uh, due to, um, August 1st, we need, uh, we noted this before, but we're putting this call out uh, again and saying, okay, now it's less than a month, so it's time to do this. Uh, you have a report due August 1st. Actually, you need to send us two reports for your consortium. One, you need to email your level gains with post-test rates re report and your NRS primary goals report. Both of those, should be a July 1st, 2017 to June 30th, 2018 report. We'll be sending a follow-up email to remind you of this as well. Um, all of those two reports should just be emailed to Sherry Eichinger by the end of the day on August 1st. So that is that helps us kind of go into the uh, is that goes into our statewide calendar for what we see as kind of data checks 
Um, so um, basically, you're, you're, we're expecting all of you to make sure that all of your uh, October through April data is ideally reviewed monthly, but on July or June 1st, we are doing a check of the data at that point. And a lot of that is through support that you submit via SERS and other things that we pull um, from the system. Uh, then May and June data uh, uh, should be reviewed uh, by July 1st so that you can submit that report to Sherry, though, to report the level gain and the uh, NRS primary goal data to Sherry by the end of the day, August 1st. And then again, we're going to have another check by November 1st um, of all July through September data. For the November 1st deadline, we don't actually um, ask you to submit a report, but we are pulling data uh, November 1st or in early November so that we can complete all of our performance uh, measure expectations that we have from, um, from the system and so that we can re uh, submit our reports to the Fed. So that is our overall cycle at this point in time. So then now let's talk about the other uh, topic that some of you were asking about earlier, assessments, tests. So some good news. Uh, first off, TABE 11 and 12 is now approved for local a AB programs in Minnesota. Um, that you can, you can start using those technically as of July 1st. Um, uh, you can use either the computer or the paper version of TABE 11 and 12, and you can use either the reading, the math, or the language test. Uh, please note that each test uh, has five different levels, L, E, M, D, A. And in the past, many local programs did not use the level L. However, with the new educational functioning level descriptors, L is probably going to be more important or more relevant for a lot of your lower level students um, in ABE. So many programs will probably now need to have level E or level L tests. Um, but please note that each test only has one option in each of those forms. There is no uh, TABE 11 E survey or and TABE 11 E complete battery. There is just a TABE 11 E. Um, there is no two. Uh, there are not. A, there's not a shorter and a longer version. There's just one version for each of those tests. Um, and I forgot to take that last bullet or that second to last bullet out, but it is approved um, at this point. Also note though that TABE 9 and 10 will likely be dropped from the approved list starting July 1st, 2019, which means we have one full fiscal year uh, for each of you locally to make that transition from the TABE 9 and 10 to the TABE 11 and 12. Also note that for each of the tests, they have revised or slightly revised their maximum allowable test time. And this is uh, for uh, levels uh, E, M, D, and A. Um, and Marty and Linda, I know that you're out there. I just wanna make sure that you're checking this slide out and you're checking my work. This is correct, correct? <laughs> <laughs> this is directly from uh, DRC, from the right. folks. Yeah. So the math test has two parts to it, but I believe the two parts are just um, for M, D, and A, if I recall correctly, not for L or E. Um, then, uh, and that test is 75 minutes for the two parts collectively. For reading, there are two parts for the reading test, um, and they're timed separately, but the total cumulative time for the reading test is 120 minutes. Thank you, Lynn, for checking my work. <laughs> Next, language. Um, I believe that just has one part to it, and it is a 60-minute test. So I think the rationale for splitting the math into two parts is there's one part that has a calculator and one part that does not have a calculator. Um, and with the reading, there's just two different parts. Um, for e with math and with reading, my understanding is for those of you that have programs where that might be too long, like 120 minutes might, might be too long of a chunk, you could, in theory, split your testing into two different days so that students don't get too burnt out at that point with the two parts of the uh, two parts of the reading test or potentially even the two parts of the math test. And note that these times have been adjusted since they were initially um, approved. Yes. They've just gone through a reapproval process to adjust the time. Yeah. 
And again, like I said before, tape 9 and 10 to tape 11 and 12, tape 9 and 10 are not considered the same. So you can't pre-test the students on tape 9 and post-test them on tape 11. If you have a pretest going into this year with TABE 9 or 10, which most of your students will, especially if you're using TABE, um, you should give them, a, we're recommending that you give them a post-test 9 or 10 before switching them over to TABE 11, 12, or you could actually overlap those as well. You don't need to wait 40 hours from your last TABE 9 or 10 to do a new TABE 11 or 12 pretest. It just is considered a different pretest, almost as if you're giving someone a CASA's math and a TABE reading. They're, Totally different uh, tests overall. So you don't have to wait for the 40 hour because the, the first time you administer a TABE 11 and 12 for students, it will be considered a new pretest. And then about CASA's goals, their new test. Just wanted to let you know that we have not yet uh, gotten approval for that and set that up yet uh, within SID or our assessment policy. We're waiting to get more addi uh, additional details to make sure that we have all the data that we need so that SID can operationalize it and that we can include everything we need for the assessment policy before we submit it to the feds. But as soon as we have all that information, we'll be resubmitting our assessment policy um, to make sure that we can uh, have local programs use that test as well. Um, so stay tuned on the approval of CASA's goals. What that means, though, is you can't start using CASA's goals yet for uh, ABE reading. So the other thing you'll see in your materials is that we have the new assessment policy attached. So please go in and check in your materials. Um, if you look in the materials, there are six different materials. And this is called the um, MNABE assessment policy. So please take a look and download this new policy and make sure you have that accessible. We'll be adding it to MNABE.org as well. Um, a couple things that are different about this version. Obviously, it includes Table 11 and 12 as the new approved assessment. It also has the new educational functioning level descriptors for ABE levels one through six. Um, they're the new, more comprehensive, uh, updated, level descriptors that align to the CCRS. And please note, though, that the ESL, ESLs, or the ESL educational functioning level descriptors, the new ones are not yet in there because there are currently no tests that are approved and that are operational for the new ESL uh, level descriptors. And as Nadine noted before in the comments, Yes, we are asking Southwest ABE as part of our ABE support network for assessment training and services. We are asking them to serve as a, as a uh, to do bulk purchasing or to coordinate bulk purchasing with local ABE programs and consortia. We encourage you to uh, work with them. The benefit is that it allows every program, no matter if you're the smallest program in the state or the largest program in the state, it allows you to purchase tests at that best bulk rate possible and um, so that will be that will be a great benefit there um, they'll be coordinating paper and or computer versions of the test or computer vouchers of the test um, local programs they're not going to be free with southwest coordinating it you still as a program have to pay for them but this will mean that you get the best rate possible um, and get the you get to maximize the use of your ad funds and not pay a higher rate um, and we're going to have, uh, they're going to coordinate that starting um, later this summer, uh, maybe in as late as September, um, but uh, purchases um, will be made at least annually um, or upon demand, and they'll kind of coordinate that um, as they see fit. So stay tuned um, for an announcement from Southwest ABE about, buy, uh, about uh, going in for per, uh, bulk purchasing of tests. And for all of you that are interested in some assessment uh, or professional development on assessment, uh, we will be offering, or Southwest AD will be offering uh, professional development at Summer Institute, Regional, and our Support Services Conference. Um, some of the test specific sessions that will be offered is the test certification for both uh, TABE and CASAs, and that's required for all staff working with uh, ABE staff working with testing. And that provides an uh, overview of all the allowable tests and how to operationalize them. That's required certification. They're also offering a critical issues and assessment, and that will dive into some more specifics into the new test 
It will also talk about computer-based testing and other topics that we, that we see emerging around the state. So keep an eye on those two types of sessions that will be offered uh, at various professional development events throughout this year, especially Summer Institute, the Regionals, and the Support Services Conference. So again, the big question for all of you locally um, is test transition. How are you going to make that change with TABE from TABE 9 and 10 to TABE 11 and 12? How are you going to do that? When are you going to purchase? Are you going to wait till Southwest sends that notice out? Or do you need to purchase at a different time for a, uh, your, your local program reasons? How are you going to make sure that all staff are trained on the new test? And what is your timeline for implementing them? Uh, what's your plan overall with all of that? Then we had a question uh, about how people will be notified when they are able to purchase, purchase tests at a bulk rate through Southwest ABE. Yep, so what you'll, what you'll find is that an email uh, will be developed by uh, Southwest ABE, and it'll either go through Southwest ABE or through Sherry. We haven't made that decision officially yet. Um, it probably makes sense to just have Sherry send it out, and it will, pro it will go to um, all of our fiscal agents, all of our managers and other administrators, um, and lead teachers. It's the manager, coordinator, and lead teacher list, which is what we often call the middle list here. So that goes out to a couple hundred people around the state from our ABE system. Um, so that's who we'll be sending that email out to. Um, there'll definitely be some time. You don't have to, you don't, it won't be probably a week turnaround. You probably will have at least a couple weeks turnaround to try to see either how much money or how many tests you need. And then they'll be able to kind of work, uh, coordinate that with, uh, with your business office to their business office. But look for logistics coming, uh, an email coming from Sherry, but it will be from Southwest, uh, it'll be written by Southwest ABE. And we're very happy that you're able to do that, Marty. Um, Marty did note that for anyone that feels they need to purchase um, immediately, the TABE uh, is offering a 10% discount on, on 11 and 12 test forms through August 15th. And all the information there can be found at www.tabetest.com. Any other questions from the chat? No, nope, that's it right now. Okay, thanks. Okay, now let's talk about GED and high school equivalency testing. First off, wanted to remind everyone that the subsidy remains the same. We had a brief Kind of, we had some brief excitement early in the spring where all of a sudden there was a proposal, there was a bill, uh, part of the education bill to actually fully fund um, the GED test this year, um, but that did not pass. Um, and so uh, the, it, it got pulled from the final version of the, of the education uh, bill, um, so it was not uh, approved. But they did approve the ongoing uh, continued subsidy of $10 off for each of the subject tests or $40 uh, per tester. And so it's all of the subsidy remains the same, which will be easy for you and your students. So you continue to use the MNGED10 code, and um, and that goes until we run out of one uh, till the end of the fiscal year, or until we run out of that one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Last year we did not come close to running out of that funding, so um, so that should last us this entire year unless we see a major bump in testing. Um, but that applies for any student then that selects Minnesota as their the location where they'll test, aka their jurisdiction, uh, and any and for the student that schedules in any non-corrections testing center in Minnesota and any approved uh, or any approved uh, border communities like Fargo, Sioux Falls, etc., Wapaton, etc. And again, making sure that they use the MNGED10 code when they check out. Um, and schedule their testing and pay for testing. So what did the numbers look like last year? If you look in the materials uh, feature, uh, there are two things that you can take a look at. One is they both are labeled MNGED testing summary. One is a two-year summary and the other is last year's summary. So one goes from July 2016 to June 2018. The other goes from July 2017 to June 2018. So you can see a one year or our past two years um, in terms of testing numbers. So overall, last year, the 17-18 year, we had uh, uh, 4,730 people take a G at least one GED test. From that, um, 2,511 
earned a GED diploma or high school equivalency diploma through the GED process. Um, so numbers are growing, which is great, but they're still not up to the pre-2014 levels. Um, and that's consistent nationwide, actually, what we're seeing in, in most other states or many other states across the nation, um, whether they're using GED, high set, or task. And then if you look at the next, uh, the next graphic here, you can see kind of month by month the different uh, the testing results. And so you saw that May was our peak month uh, this past year, where in May we had um, all, um, between 16 and 1,700 uh, tests taken. That's not testers, that's the number of tests taken that month. And um, you'll see, uh, so you'll see that there's been, we've traditionally with the exception of July, we've stayed above a, th uh, a thousand and typically we're somewhere between 1,000 tests taken per month or, or to 1,500. But you can see we have a couple outliers there on each end. So take a look at those two, the GED testing uh, resources. But if you want to d uh, dive into the numbers a little bit more. Then I wanted to give you an update on our uh, high school equivalency test selection ADE stakeholder group. Um, you know, the group really has thought hard about how can they come up with a catchier name, but unfortunately we're still, we're, we're still stuck with that um, lengthy title. But we have our amazing 16 person uh, stakeholder group that's been providing a lot of great input and data um, and just great feedback about what our students need and what is um, what's best for us as um, at statewide for to ser serve our communities. So they've been working really hard to, to reframe uh, suggestions and recommendations going into this process. We had a second meeting with them on Tuesday, June 26th. And at that meeting, we uh, reviewed research from other states and, um, and from assessment uh, specialists. We revised and prioritized recommendations for the test proposal criteria and the actual test, uh, the RFP, the procurement process overall. Um, and so what that leads to is one of our next big next step is um, that we at the Department of Education are now going to work with the Department of Administration, who is going to oversee the RFP or the request for proposal process. And um, so you can see in the material section, I provided a couple of things for you that will help. Um, so the, in the materials, we have the um, high school equivalency test criteria recommendations. It's a draft from uh, June 26, 2018. And so you can see there what the revised set of criteria that the um, not since 26, uh, not since, not after this last session, but going into this last session, you can see the criteria that they had helped uh, to prioritize. And then the other is the research document further down. Um, it says research on high school equivalency testing. There you can see some of the interviewer, uh, summaries of the interviews that were conducted that they used to help guide uh, and help further inform the recommendations that they made. So I want to send a big thank you to all of our stakeholder group um, uh, members and all of the great hard work that they've done uh, throughout this process. So thank you all very much for, for, uh, for doing the best work and really keep, keeping our students at, in, in mind as you develop this process and um, for doing a great job of representing our wide variety of AB programs and our wide variety of AB students. Okay, Brad, we've got a couple of questions before we move on here. One question about the GED data. Yeah. Um, Pam asking about getting reports that filter that would show the differences in each year. She's especially interested in seeing the report for July 1, 2014 to June 2015 to see how much has changed since the implementation of the new GED. Yeah, we can try to... Uh... I, I, I'm assuming, Pam, that you're like, basically you'd like what I just did for this last year, the June, uh, the statewide summary, like I just published or just shared um, in the materials. So you'd like to see one for each year going back to July 2014. That's as far back as we can go. Actually, J January 1, 2014 is the furthest back we can go with our analytics system. But I could put each of those, put, publish each of those on the MNAB website. Okay, and then, um... Another question, just getting clarification um, around the, uh, has there been much discussion about switching to a different state approved high school equivalency test 
or will Minnesota be sticking with the GED for the foreseeable future? That is that is what the that is, stakeholder group is informing that process. Yep, the stakeholder group has really been helping to inform that process. There's been a lot of debate, single test versus multi-test, and overall, what are the criteria? So that stakeholder group has been diving into what do we need out of, out of an approved high school equivalency test or from any approved test that we would uh, that we would use here in Minnesota. What do our students need? What do our programs need? What do our communities need? So ultimately, there will be an RFP that will go out later this year, and through that RFP, uh, a test or test will be selected. Yep. Yeah. And so we envision that an announcement will be made on which test or tests will be approved um, probably by January of 2019. Maybe a little after January but look for something this winter. Any other questions around high school equivalency testing? Please note that we have six materials that we hope that you uh, download uh, today. So in addition to that, uh, Literacy Action Network will have the recording, the PowerPoint, um, and handouts uh, posted to their uh, to the Literacy Action Network website. Thank you all very much for participating today. We're lucky to give you uh, that we didn't go over on time and that we stayed within our time limit, so that's great. Um, we really, though, want you to make sure to fill out those evaluations. So get one, a prompt, right at when you shut down today. So hopefully you can fill it out right away. Um, if you don't, you'll get an email reminder, um, I believe, tomorrow, later today or tomorrow. Uh, but we really need you to fill out that evaluation because we, that is asking for some specific feedback, especially about the manager meeting. And we really want some ideas about what you want to see included in the manager meeting to make sure it meets your needs. Our upcoming web chat, um, again, we're sticking to the 1 o'clock to 2.30 time frame typically. Our next one is December 5th, so it's a, little, it's a couple months away. It feels like a long ways away. Let's enjoy the summer before yeah. we talk about December. <laughs> Um, and then we'll have one February 6th and then May 1st um, again. So those, that's the upcoming web chats for the next fiscal year. So now um, we have all of our contact information here, but let's open it up for additional questions. And Marty does note in the chat that she does not know yet what the bulk price will be. She's waiting on a quote from the tape rep. Thank you, Marty, for coordinating that. So again, you can chat in questions, or if you've got a longer, more complicated question, go ahead and raise your hand and we can unmute you. Okay. Hey. 